two police officers brought a broken Nancy into an interrogation room. It had no windows and had a huge two-way mirror on one side. In the middle, there was a table and two chairs facing each other. There was a microphone and camera on the table. One officer sat her down facing the mirror. She sat up, tears streaming down her face. The two men left the room, and a young woman entered wearing a badge hanging from the end of a cord around her neck. I'm Detective Sarah, Sarah Lincoln. She sat down opposite Nancy. I know this is a very difficult time for you, but we need to talk about everything, including what happened this morning in the liquor store parking lot. I've already told the two officers everything, Detective. I've been here for four hours, and I need to get home to my daughter. Nancy fell silent and began to cry. The detective turned to the mirror and made a gesture. An officer immediately entered the room with a box of tissues, placed it on the table next to Nancy, and left, closing the door behind him. My 13-year-old daughter needs me, and I need to go, Nancy begged, with tears in her eyes. I completely understand, Mrs. Westford, but there was so much crying and sobbing that the two officers did not understand anything. After you called your parents, they went to your house, and they were with your daughter, the detective said in a soothing voice. I have a few questions. We need to understand the whole situation. She took Nancy's hand. This is not an interrogation. Think of it as a conversation between two women. I understand, Nancy sobbed. Would you like something to drink, Mrs. Westford? Coffee, water? No, thanks. I'm fine. Let's just end this conversation, please. Where should I start? Nancy took a tissue from the box and wiped away her tears. Let's start from the very beginning. I was born Nancy Stewart. On my first day of first grade, my teacher made me sit next to Steve Westford. He was a very charming boy. He had cool school supplies like colorful pens, a pencil with a Mickey head on top, a butterfly sharpener, and a scented eraser. We became friends and sat together during lunch. In the afternoon, when my mother came to pick me up, he ran up to us and gave me a pen. Nancy smiled. Mom was surprised by his kind gesture. She later told me that on my first day of school, I already had a crush. Since then, we have always been together and did all our classes together. Of course, we always sat next to each other. The whole school knew that we were inseparable. We lost our virginity together on the night of our high school graduation. He was always gentle and passionate. What about both of your parents? They knew that we had been in love since childhood, and that was fine with them. We were in college. I chose business administration, and he chose accounting. He was always very good with numbers. After college, he got a job as a junior accountant at a cosmetics company, and I went to work in the administrative department of a supply company. Three months later, we got married. Steve was an only child and we stayed with his parents. Steve said we could save money to buy or rent a house when we have kids. A year later, Stephanie was born. Steve was the happiest man in the world and I immediately knew that my daughter would become a daddy's girl. After we brought our baby home, he spent most of his time in her room, standing by her crib and either humming or singing. Did he neglect you? asked Sarah. Oh, no. He was a real gentleman. Nancy began to cry again. Be of good courage, Mrs. Westford. My relatives helped us. They looked after Steph. Steve's mother was a housewife and took care of her when I returned to work. Steve always called his parents by their first names, John and Mary. As Steph grew older, she started calling them by their names, too. A real dad's daughter. What about your parents? It was my grandfather and grandmother. Life seemed to be good. No mortgage. Your daughter was looked after by her grandmother, sorry, Mary, a loving husband and also a caring father. So what went wrong? When I lived with my mother-in-law, it was as if I was being watched every time. If I was even ten minutes late getting home from work, Mary would ask if there was heavy traffic on the road. When I went shopping alone, she asked where I was going and when I would be back. When I wore a tight dress to work, she commented on it. It was as if I was living in a prison. Maybe she was too caring. What about Steve? Steve is the nicest person I've ever met. He would never say anything that would hurt me. He once told me that we were in love before we were born. 
This is my Steve. Did you ever tell him that his mother was watching you? No, never. He was so close to his parents that I never wanted to bring up the issue. I knew that he would immediately find a house and move away from his parents. I didn't want this to happen. Nancy sobbed. He promised to protect me, take care of me, and give me all his love. He always treated me like a queen. Would you like to take a short break, Nancy? Sarah asked in a motherly voice. No, let's finish this. I need to go home. As you wish. Sarah took a deep breath. What was the turning point? After Steph turned eight, John decided to retire early. He bought a three-bedroom apartment in Naples, Florida, near the beach, and left the house to us. We only had to pay utilities and property taxes. John and Mary still owned the house. When they moved out, I felt like I had my freedom again, but it was heartbreaking for Steve and Steph. I started wearing whatever I wanted. When I came in late at night after work, I didn't have to answer to anyone. My colleagues, who always invited me to their bachelorette parties and whom I had always turned down in the past, were shocked when one Friday night I showed up alone at the bar they usually go to. Steve agreed to let you go to these parties alone? Yes, indeed. He loved me so much that he never refused me anything. He trusted me more than anything in the world. There were single and married women in our group. Some were faithful to their boyfriends or husbands and some were not. Whatever happened during these night walks remain our secret. I always drew a line between myself and the men we met. And then one Friday evening, I met a married man. We talked, we drank, we danced. On the dance floor, he hugged me tightly and I felt the bulge in his pants. It was exciting. After a couple of dances, he led me outside to his car, which was parked in the far corner. He opened the back door and bent me over the seat, lifted my skirt and pulled down my panties. I asked him to put on a condom. He opened the front door and took one out of the glove compartment. Without foreplay, he had sex with me and did it like there was no tomorrow. After he released the seed inside the rubber, he took it off, tied it, and buttoned up his trousers. When he pulled me out of the car, I could still feel my heart pounding. He closed the back door and thanked me for the sex. He got into the car and drove away. I returned to the bar. Why did you cheat on your husband? Because I could. It was exciting and it was just sex. That night when I returned home, Steve was already asleep. I looked at him and cried. I promised myself that I would never do this again. Then I remembered that I had already done this at the altar, in the house of God, in front of friends and relatives. That night I couldn't sleep. I hated myself. The next day I couldn't look him in the eye. He asked me if anything bad had happened. I lied. I told him I didn't feel well. In fact, I was full of remorse. That night, as a sign of repentance to forgive myself, I had amazing sex with him. The next morning, I woke him up and we made love again. When was the next time you cheated on your husband? I stopped going to bachelorette parties. Every time my colleagues invited me, I always found an excuse to refuse. About six months later, as they begged me to be present that evening, one of my colleagues, Carmela, our department manager, intervened on my behalf and told them that I was not interested and to leave me alone. Later, during lunch, she came and sat next to me. She was about 50 years old and already a grandmother. She never dated her colleagues. She asked me why I refused to be at the bachelorette party. I replied that I did not want to cheat on my husband by being alone with other men. The temptation was there, and at any moment I could cross the line. She looked into my eyes and asked if I had done this before. At that particular moment, I couldn't lie to her. I told her the truth and how it hurt. As a mature woman, I hope she gave you good advice. Sarah intervened. Nancy lowered her eyes and shook her head. She took my hand and started telling me about her life. She got married young. She had two daughters, already married, with children. After menopause, she began to feel old, which she could not accept. She began wearing tight, low-cut dresses, wearing a lot of makeup, and styling her hair like young girls. Her husband handled it well, and yet she was not satisfied. One Saturday after shopping, she was in a cafe, and a young man of about 20 was sitting next to her. After she finished her coffee, he didn't hesitate to ask her if she wanted to have some fun. 
Stunned at first, she smiled and asked if he knew of a secluded place. The young man drove with her in her car and showed her an underground garage where there were no cameras. He had sex with her in the back seat. She liked it, and most importantly, she felt rejuvenated and full of strength and energy as a woman. They began to meet regularly, and six months later, he brought a friend with him, and later, another. Until now, she had taken lovers who were in their early twenties. Her husband never noticed this? She is very careful. I asked her if she had any regrets. She told me that she loved only her husband, and with her young lovers, she only had sex. To rid herself of guilt, she believed, she never allowed herself to make love to them. Making love to her was only for her husband. She also said that if her husband didn't know about it, it wouldn't hurt him. My God, don't tell me you let her influence you. Unfortunately, yes. The bachelorette party started again, but this time I wasn't alone. Steve thought I was with my colleagues. I decided to have sex with married men only because, obviously, when they cheat on their wives, they will keep everything a secret. You can't imagine how many of them are out there trying their luck to have sex with other women. As long as there is supply, there will be demand, Sarah noted. I always ended relationships after seven to eight months. Nancy ignored Sarah's sarcasm. I was afraid that a long-term relationship would pose a danger to my married life. And at the same time, I wanted to know different types of men. After one lover, I paused for two or three months and then looked for another. Where did you meet them? As I mentioned earlier, these married men are everywhere. They can be found in every bar. We had sex in motels on Saturdays. And when I went shopping alone, leaving Steve at home to take care of Stephanie and the housework, and during my bachelorette parties or during a long lunch at work. Some to me's, after work, we'd have quick sex in the back seat of my car. You were very busy. Are you ever teared when you get home? How could you live your double life without regrets? I'm used to it. However, I never refused Steve anything. He had me whenever he wanted. Additionally, I insisted that my lovers wear condoms during sex, even though I was on birth control. I didn't want to bring any diseases home. So there were no problems? Yes, until I met Lou, about six months ago. This was the biggest mistake of my life. Sarah shook her head. Tell me how it all started with Mr. Cipher. Lou Cipher, won't you? Yes. One Saturday I was in the supermarket, and as I bent over to grab a bottle of juice from the bottom shelf, I felt someone crotch me in the ass. I turned around in shock. It was Lou. He said he was very sorry and that he had tripped over something. At this particular moment, there was no one in the passage. There was no one who could confirm whether this was a deliberate act or not. Then he left with a smile. As I walked to my car in the parking lot, I couldn't stop thinking about this guy. As I was about to get into my car, he came up to me out of nowhere and apologized again. This time I was able to see him. I told him it was an accident and everything was fine. He invited me for coffee and I told him I was married and showed him my ring finger. He said that doesn't stop him. He wrote his name and phone number on a piece of paper and handed it to me. He asked me to call him whenever I wanted to talk to a friend. And you didn't throw away the piece of paper with the phone number, did you? No. I thought about him all day and the rest of the week. That Friday, I led myself into temptation. I called him. He was waiting for my call. We agreed to meet the next day at his house. He gave me the address. I never met my lovers in their places for obvious reasons. It was exciting to have sex with someone in his own bed, while at the same time I was going against my rules and beliefs about single men. I decided to try it. We met on Saturday, and the first thing I told him was that he should wear protection. He was a little indignant and then obeyed. He accepted my terms. He knew how to use his big tool, and I felt great satisfaction several times. So, it wasn't a one-time affair? Nancy shook her head. No. We continued to meet the same way I met with my previous lovers. After about three months, I noticed that he was becoming a little possessive. One night during my bachelorette party, he begged me to spend the night with him because he wanted me to wake up in his arms the next morning. Did you really agree? How could I? Then he wanted to meet on a more regular basis, which I refused. 
Then he gave me the powder and told me to add it to Steve's drink during dinner. I did this, and he slept like the dead. Then he came to me at night and had sex with me in my bed while my husband was sleeping next to me. It was crazy, and I told him I would never do anything like that again. That's when I decided to distance myself from him. I stopped seeing him during lunch or after work. I found all sorts of excuses. We met after three missed Saturdays. He wasn't happy. He was annoyed. He had hard sex with me. He was furious and pounded me so hard that it hurt me. After the second round, he asked me to cut Steve off from sex. What have you done? Steve was my man. I belonged to him. I stopped seeing Lou for almost a month. He kept calling me and sending me messages. From time to time, I answered him that I was busy, and that last time he hurt me so much that I still had not recovered. He apologized and even sent me flowers to my office. Then, last Saturday, I wanted to meet him one last time and tell him it was over between us. I also realized that I had gone too far with my cheating and it was time to put an end to it. This would be my last date, and after that, I would be the best wife a husband could have. Nancy looked away from Sarah, hundreds of thoughts running through her head at that moment. As usual, we met at his house, Nancy continued. We were in a missionary position when he turned me around and I landed on all fours. He hugged my waist and lifted it. He wanted to change position. I didn't want to experiment with sex and especially since I wanted to break up with him. I started to resist. I struggled and managed to jump out of bed. He grabbed my hand and forcefully pulled me back onto the bed. I kicked him very hard in the groin. He let go of me, clenched in pain and assumed the fetal position. I immediately grabbed my mobile phone which was lying on the nightstand. I told him I would dial 911 if he continued to try to rape me. He didn't answer. He moaned in the fetal position. I shouted to him that I didn't want to see him anymore. I quickly put on my dress and left his house. Did he try to contact you after that? No, he didn't contact me all week until this morning. Nancy took a deep breath and shook her head. After about ten missed calls from him, I blocked his number. Then he called his home phone. I don't know how he found out my home phone number. I never gave it to him. Perhaps, without your knowledge, he took it from the contact list in your mobile phone. Maybe. Probably when I was in the bathroom. Steve went to the liquor store to buy some wine. Today he wanted to surprise my daughter and me with dinner with wine and tiramisu for dessert. Steph answered the phone, and Lou gave his full name and said that he was a colleague at work and needed to discuss an important file with me. She told him that I was busy and would call him back later. After she told me about Lou, I asked my daughter to go and clean her room. I know that she always turned the music up louder. Then I went down to the basement and called him from my cell phone. Nancy fell silent and stared at the floor. What did he say? Sarah asked after a pause. He asked me to come to his house immediately, otherwise he would tell Steve about my affair. I immediately replied that I intended to tell my husband about my betrayal. I told him that Steve loved me so much that he would forgive me. We would go to therapy together and I would never look at another man again. Steve would be the only one who would be with me until death do us part. Nancy sniffled and wiped her tears. Then he said something that scared me. What was it? Sarah frowned. He said that Steve certainly likes wine and that he has good taste. I froze in place. I'm speechless. He then continued by saying that if he couldn't have me, then no one else could have me either. Then I heard two shots and people screaming. I panicked. I shouted questions to him about what was happening, what kind of shots I heard, what did he do. There was no answer until I heard the car door close. He said the same thing, that if he couldn't have me, no one could. Then I heard a single shot. I panicked. I got into my car and raced to the liquor store. When I got there, the police had already wrapped the crime scene in yellow tape. I found my Steve dead in the parking lot with two holes in his chest. Nancy burst into tears. Lou Cipher was found dead in his car near the crime scene with a hole in the back of his head. Apparently, he shot himself in the mouth. Sarah took Nancy's hand. You have a daughter to take care of. She turned to the mirror and nodded. Your parents are waiting in the waiting room. Come on, I'll take you to them. Walking down the corridor, Sarah stopped Nancy. According to what you said, 
Steve was a very good husband and father. He loved his family. He was a good cook, did household chores, and looked after the yard and house. He gave you complete freedom. He was the reliable and ideal husband that any woman would dream of, and yet you cheated on him. It was a mistake. Fatal, deadly mistake. Sarah looked at Nancy with disgust, turned around, and walked away. Nancy ran up to her parents and hugged them. They were all crying. Did you leave Steph alone at home? asked Nancy. Steve's parents, John and Mary, arrived an hour earlier. Steph called them, and they took the next available flight. Go home. Both of her parents took Nancy by the hand and led her out of the station. When they got to the house, some of Stephanie's friends were there. Nancy saw John and Mary. They didn't smile at her. I need to see Stephanie. Where is she? asked Nancy. She's in her room with her friends, Mary answered. At the same time, Steph walked down the stairs, accompanied by her friends. Looking at her, Nancy realized that she had been crying for several hours. John! Steph screamed. Throw that bitch out of your house! She turned to Nancy and said with hatred, You killed my father, you slut! No! Nancy exclaimed. Let me explain. There's nothing to explain here, slut. This is written about in all the news, on the internet, on social networks. Stephanie spat. A man killed his mistress's husband and then committed suicide. They were all stunned by Steph's reaction. Her friends tried to calm her down, but to no avail. Steph walked up to John and Mary. John, I don't want to see her anymore. Just tell her to leave. Please, Steph, Nancy begged. It was a mistake, a terrible mistake. My father died without ever knowing that his loving wife was a deceiver and a liar. My father was killed without knowing the reason. He was killed not knowing that the one who pulled the trigger was his wife's lover. He died without ever knowing that he was a cuckold. This is a tragedy, and we are all in dire straits. Grandfather tried to calm the situation. Let's take care of what needs to be done first and then work on our problems. With this bitch next to me, no way. Please, Steph, don't say such words towards your mother, said the grandmother. Let her talk, John shouted. Mary took his hand and pulled him towards her. Mary, today we lost our son because of this whore. Steph's friends excused themselves and headed for the door. Your daughter is a cheating bitch, John continued. You know it, we know it and the whole world learned about it after my only son was killed. Usually children have to bury their parents. Today we, parents, must bury our son. John, I want my father to be buried where you live now, in Naples. Everyone turned to Stephanie. You still know a lot of people in this town, Steph continued. You still have some connections. Contact the right people to do this. And most importantly, contact a lawyer so that he prepares all the documents for my adoption. Please, Steph, don't do something you'll regret later, Grandfather begged. Please, you can't do this to me, Nancy screamed. I can't live in the same house with this cheating whore. I can't breathe the same air as her. She disgusts me. I don't want to see her face anymore. Steph turned to John. Ask her to leave, please. We are also your grandparents, the grandmother cried. You are part of our life. Grandma. Grandpa. I love you with all my heart. I respect you and will never forget what you did for me. But your daughter is a bitch, and I can't stand her. I am Westford and belong to the Westford family. You'll take me to school on Monday, John. I will need my documents to transfer to another school in Naples. Of course I will do it. John pulled Steph towards him and hugged her. You will also need to sell this house. Too many memories. Steph wiped away her tears. Nancy, take whatever you want from this house, John said imperiously. We will donate the rest to charity. Stephanie moved to Naples, Florida. She never forgave Nancy. She only spoke to her grandparents when they called. Once a week, she visited Steve's grave. John and Mary were now her parents. Nancy started seeing a psychiatrist, but after a couple of months, the situation worsened. She had to be admitted to a psychiatric clinic. Her doctor begged Steph to meet her mother just once and forgive her. This would help Nancy in her recovery. Steph flatly refused. On the morning of Steph's 18th birthday, a nurse discovered Nancy's motionless body in her bed 
and a pool of blood on the floor. At night, she cut her wrists. Stephanie refused to attend the funeral. Yes, fraud always has a price. Subscribe to our channel so that your second chaff doesn't cheat on you and go ahead and listen to the next story, because this story is nothing compared to the next one. If you're under 18, don't even think about listening to the next one.